labour market developments. Um, so she's here to discuss the granularity of what's happening on the ground across China. Um, the other co-host for this session is David Humphreys. Um, David is the Director of Custom Research in the Americas for the Economist Intelligence Unit, and he joined the business about a year ago. Um, he's a specialist in a whole number of areas. He's run studies, multi-country studies, on topics as diverse as food security to public-private partnerships across Latin America. Um, his specializations include strategic planning, investment opportunity analysis, um, and looking at regulatory impacts and market entry analysis. Before he joined the EIU, um, he was a director of Latin America at Frost & Sullivan, um, leading strategic initiatives for multinational firms on a whole range of, of topic areas. Um, so if Louise and David would like to join me on the stage, um, and then Louise will introduce the rest of the panelists. So thank you very much. Hi, everyone, again. Well, good morning again. Um, so this session will be discussing the uh, wage and talent issues in China. Uh, but first, I would like to introduce to uh, you our panelists. Um, now, sitting next to me is David Humphreys, who is responsible for EIU's custom research or the bespoke research um, in America. Um, he has been joining us for a few years, and he is um, a leading expert on our talent and wage issue. So um, thanks, David, for joining me. Absolutely. Um, and then also joining us, we have uh, Mr. William Yu, who is the president of security technologies and residential solutions of Ingersoll-Rand uh, Asia Pacific. He's also the dean of Ingersoll-Rand Safety and Security um, Institute. Please, Mr. William Yu while he comes on board. Um, he has been working at Ink since 1997, and impressively, he has worked in China and overseas. And among those experiences, he actually spent 12 years working in a major state-owned enterprises in China. So, so I believe everyone is like me, very much looking forward to him sharing his experience of, of working in China and overseas. Um, and also, we have Dr. Teng Bing Sheng, who is the Associate Professor of Strategic Management at Cheng Kong Graduate School of um, Business. And he's also the dean of the school's European campus, in fact. He obtained his PhD from the City University of New York in 1998, um, and he had served as a tenured associate professor of strategic management at George Washington University as well. And he's been noted, and his biography appears in Who's Who in America and Who's Who in American's Higher Education. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming them. Well, thanks everyone again. Um, but to start with, I'm sure everyone knows that uh, rising wages is a rising theme in China nowadays. In fact, we've seen that the wages are growing 15% a year in China in the past several years. At the same time, China is really climbing up its value added chain, in which case um, finding skilled workers is quite different from just having tons of unskilled workers. Um, to, to kick off the conversation, David, uh, would you like to share with us your views um, on the global wage and talent front and in China specifically? Okay, let's see if I can go ahead and stand up here, give a, a few brief comments before we get going. I'll make sure to go ahead and keep it brief. Not only am I keeping you from lunch, we have some very distinguished guests here today have some very interesting thoughts on the concept of global talent. No topic in the EIU over the last year has come up more than the concept of talent. How fast will wages rise? Certainly being able to find skilled labor uh, in many places of the world. Understanding and managing human risk, uh, human capital risk has been very, very critical. And what I want to be able to do before we get into the panel is to go ahead and talk about some global context issues give you a bit of a framework of the issues that are impacting not only China, but the rest of the world. Let's see if we can go here. Not sure how to. Just hit the green button, it looks like. Um, one of the major themes that we have seen is the strategic nature in which human capital is being dealt with today. That has not always been the case. In many cases, strategic decisions have been made without incorporating folks from human resources. And those and the folks in HR have really taken a back seat, particularly in the boardroom, when it comes to making those strategic decisions. 
However, in a recent survey done by PwC, over 50% of CEOs state today one of their biggest issues and growing globally is being able to find the right skills. And that means that concept, that risk, has risen to the level of other business risks that have been dealt with for many, many years. Um, and thus, human capital also must be dealt with in that same way. Um, certainly what that means is a much more strategic approach to the way human capital is dealt with. Analytical workforce planning, proactive uh, retention activities, and really having a seat at the boardroom is really very critical when it comes to managing a very important asset for all of our businesses. One of the other factors and major themes impacting global talent is really the importance of emerging markets for the bottom line and opportunities for everybody um, in the business world today. What you see here in the quote, as well as the graph, really talks about the conflicting situation that companies face out in the world. CEOs give a mandate, we need you to grow in those markets that you can see in this chart are the fast growing markets over the next five years. That is where the growth is going to occur. At the same time, management is left with a difficult task of overcoming those risks, including those related to labor, um, and going through and executing upon those strategies. Um, this is certainly not a factor only for Western multinationals, but also those here in China. We've already heard earlier on today, the single most important factor of Chinese multinationals going abroad is access to markets. Um, and so certainly this is gonna be an important factor in growing in emerging markets outside of China. Um, the impact in global talent is rather obvious. More competition in these markets means more competition for those skilled talent labor that we're looking for today. And so in some senses, in those emerging markets, the situation is gonna get more challenging than it is gonna get better in the short term. Certainly no topic within those challenges is talk more about wages. Luis talked about it very briefly. I'm sure in our panel we'll talk about wages. Um, certainly the rising wages within China and other places of the world is a very, very critical issue in analyzing. Um, what we're starting to learn that it isn't necessarily all about wages when companies look towards making investment decisions. It's about the total cost of production, or being able to get your product to market. It's being able to innovate and respond to market needs. And so certainly that is a consideration when making investment decisions. Maybe in the short term you will see investments going inland or maybe the boomerang effect of going back to developed countries like the U.S. But in the long term, certainly the way decisions are made in terms of investments will incorporate much other things than the unpredictable nature when it comes to wages. The last theme really is surrounding in terms of talent. Uh, and being able to find the skilled labor. And what I like about the two quotes that you see here, and I'm sure will be part of the, the conversation, it is not just about the gaps in technical skills that exist today, but those practical ones, the management ones and leadership that businesses around the world, including in China, um, are so really in need of to be able to push forward those business strategies. Certainly there are uh, strategies and one can go through and upskill and develop talent. The use of clusters is one particular topic in being able to do value added work um, and developing the talent moving forward. What you see here in the slide is just representation of education, not the only issue, demographics, technology, all impact the development and access to uh, the talent over time. Um, this skills gap in the short term, there is no easy solution um, and I'm sure it will be one of the topics that we talk about today. I will go ahead and leave you with this slide, which is a representation of growth, not absolute um, terms, but growth of wages compared to a few other countries in the world. And I think sets the tone for the conversation that we're about to have. Thank you, David. Mr. Yu, uh, would you like to start by sharing with us your views on the rising wages um, and finding talents in China. Okay, uh, thank you. I, it's, it's my pleasure to have this opportunity. Okay. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, this uh, rising wages. Uh, rising wages is a big, big challenge to the business leaders in China, in Asia Pacific. Um, and uh, when, uh, when the people graduate in 1985 from the college, 
we only get paid, need to pay 56 RMB per month. Six, 56. The second year we need to pay the graduate from college, we only need to pay 73 per month. And today, how much we need to pay? Depends. Uh, normally we pay 4,000, 5,000, sometimes 10,000 RMB per month to the graduate from the, from the colleges. <laughs> and based on the Statistic Bureau's numbers, from year 2003 to year 2010, in China manufacturing sector, the annual salary growth is 13.6%. And, and in year 2011, compared with year 2010, the salary growth rate is 18.5%. So the growth rate is, uh, is expedite. And uh, used to be the labor cost is only single digit or the total percent of the cost. Now, for many, many companies, it's more than uh, uh, 15%. Uh, some of them even go up uh, beyond um, 20%. And this is uh, still a beginning. As, uh, as the last session, some people said, it's a beginning for the business opportunity. Also, the rising wage is just the beginning because based on one of the report from International Monetary Fund, this report said that during the period of year 2020 and the year 2005, China will end up the surplus of cheap labor to enter into a year or an age of lack of the talent or lack of the labor. So, so the rising wage will maybe more, uh, if not uh, the same as, as today. So, so this is a challenge for the business leaders like me, like, uh, like many people sit in this room. Uh, second, I want to talk about uh, the talent. As a business leaders in Asia, in China, everyone uh, has different challenges. We talk about growth, we talk about profit, we talk about uh, uh, cash, we talk about customer satisfaction, all these different kind of challenges. But almost for every business leaders in China and Asia, there's one common theme, which is talent. Um, and the talent is, uh, is not only uh, uh, because the company needs the talent, what I will describe is the war of the talent. Uh, I see many, a few cases that other companies try to hire the employee from my company and they not only pay 20% more, they not only pay 30% more. We have cases that other companies pay double the salary even three times the salary to hire a person from my company. And two years ago, when I took the current job, I really want to go to tier two, tier three cities, like uh, uh, Luis just described that uh, there's more opportunities in other cities outside of Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. So we want to have more branch offices outside of these tier one cities. I could get the budget, I could get the approvals. The only reason I could not have more than 10 offices in one year is I do not have sufficient qualified branch managers. So company like us, we do have some money and we do want to go to other cities, but we, we are struggled with the talent. The third thing is I want to uh, highlight and share with you is uh, uh, how to address these challenges. Uh, there's many, many ways. Uh, we could uh, consult with uh, EIU and to give us a strategy uh, or, or channel strategy or business strategy. But the one thing that we are doing is develop talent by ourselves. So two years ago when I took the job, you know, I do find this talent shortage problem or challenge, we set up a training program called the BMDP, Branch Manager Development Program. Uh, half of the course is being delivered by external uh, professors uh, uh, or experts. Half of them being delivered by people like me and the my direct reports. And we have over 15 courses. We have a specific real project and we have senior managers to be the sponsor and to be the champion. So 25 talents, young talent being trained uh, on the job and also in the classroom. And 18 months later, they graduate. 17 of them being promoted. Two of them being promoted twice. And all of them are very successful. So we kick off the second wave of the BMDP program. Because of this success, last year we launched the sales certification 
training. We launched service engineer certification training. We also, this year, we launched uh, the project management uh, certification training. And the good thing is, we not only deliver this training to our employee, to our talent, we also start to offer this, these trainings to our dealers, to our business partners. Uh, last month, we now start to talk with uh, local colleges because we could not wait the students spend three, four, five years in the college and, and learn everything from the paper. We now go to the colleges to work with them and invite them to come to our company. And we also have our experts, our engineers come to the off, uh, colleges to deliver the training along with the, along with the professors. Uh, so currently we are working with two local colleges and uh, the, the dean, the vice dean of the colleges really love this idea. Last weekend I had the opportunity to talk with uh, 40 general managers of uh, medium and uh, small and medium private companies. I talked about this uh, program, they all love it. They're waiting for the students to uh, come from these programs. So with this, I will uh, I hand over to uh, another point. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. And uh, Dr. Tan, uh, would you like to share your views on the wages and talent? I mean, you've worked on this extensively and published many papers on this as well. How do you think this is the case? Sure, I think uh, we need to separate blue colors with uh, white colors. Although the definition uh, has been evolving as well. According to one report, last year, uh, if you make more than 5,000 per month RMB, uh, you are you know, defined as white collar. And that threshold now is uh, 20,000 per month. So in just one year, it's like four times higher, the threshold. Um, for the blue collar uh, segment, I think that is the competitive advantage of China, uh, which actually led to the cost advantage of a lot of the uh, companies in China. And actually that's the reason why a lot of uh, uh, people return to China. For example, I know some friends who uh, decided to return because now they can afford domestic helpers. They can afford drivers you know, for them, which are not you know, uh, uh, possible uh, in the US. Uh, in this area, I returned to China in 2007. Uh, in six years, the price of my domestic helper uh, increased 500%. 500% in six years. So that's just, you know, it gives you a sense of how uh, much wage had increased uh, in, in this segment. But I think it's right. It's the right thing to do because uh, China has the highest Gini ratio uh, in the world, uh, which is a source of social instability uh, in the long run. So it is uh, uh, a righteous for the government to decide that in the next 10 years or the, for the new government, we not only need to double our uh, GDP, uh, in eight years, actually we have eight years uh, left. But we also need to increase uh, uh, GDP per capita or personal income also uh, in, in the same period. So that means the, the lowest income people will enjoy uh, the highest uh, increase in, in the next eight years. And I think that's, that's, you know, uh, that's fine, that's the right thing to do. So for companies, you would definitely face rising uh, wages in the, in the uh, blue collar uh, area. So the implication is that uh, a lot of companies are either moving you know, inland or moving out of the country. I have some EMBA students uh, you know, uh, whose companies that I visited a few years ago and uh, they were sharing uh, with me the dilemma they had in China uh, because some of these, their factories uh, are, were in areas close to Shanghai and they just couldn't afford, afford the kind of uh, wages um, uh, in that area. So they thought about moving to Guizhou or moving to Vietnam. And in the end, they decided that Vietnam will be a better place to go because uh, you know, the overall uh, cost structure will be more attractive. So that means you have to have a strategy to deal with rising uh, wages in this area. Secondly, in the white collar area, which is almost so pretty familiar uh, since I've been uh, responsible for our MBA program, in the last four years. Uh, recently, I turned to run our European operation. So I know uh, how much our MBA graduates uh, make upon their graduation. Three years ago, the average was about uh, 280,000 RMB. And the last year, it was close to 400,000 
uh, RMB. So in three years, again, uh, you're talking about 40% increase uh, for our, our MBA graduates. And also interestingly, uh, increasing number of uh, MBA graduates want to work for ch local Chinese firms because they feel that the multinationals no longer offer uh, the salary advantage. Uh, not only the salary is not necessarily higher, but the whole package uh, is much less competitive as compared to not only state-owned companies in China, but also private firms. The pri private companies in China tend to use stock options or other generous bonus at the uh, year end to attract top talents. So a lot of our best people, best graduates actually join private firms uh, and state-owned firms. So I think for MNCs in China, they do have a, a major uh, challenge in getting the best talents in China. And how do you deal with that? I think you have to change your mentality that uh, uh, a talent or a young talent in your company is like a, just in Chinese we call it a screw. You just put a screw in that huge machine and he or she is just supposed to do the job uh, in a routine way. While in a Chinese company, uh, although uh, the, the same person probably would take on more responsibilities and have more room for growth. Of course, it will be more risky. A lot of them may not survive at the end of the year, but they like the challenge, they like the opportunity to be exposed to you know, more tasks. So I think that's really something that um, MNCs have to think seriously. That's all I have for now. Right, thank you. Um, now, all the three of you keep talking about rising wages, but let's look at the other side of the story. How do you see the rise in productivity in China? Um, a few things. One is uh, uh, I read the, the uh, report and find out in the manufacturing f uh, sector in China, within the last uh, almost 10 years, uh, almost every year our pr labor productivity being improved by 8%. Some years being improved by more than 10%. And I think, especially when I visit uh, uh, my company of manufacturing facility, but also the Chinese uh, private companies, I could see a lot of opportunities to improve the labor efficiency and uh, so that the employee could get more money and uh, the company still maintain the profit, if not improve. It's a huge opportunity. And also, uh, I spend a lot of time study and learn and practice uh, a thing called the Lean and Six Sigma. And so in order to encourage the people in this room to ask uh, questions, I bring a book I just uh, published, uh, which is uh, uh, Gamba Works. This is the part of talking about how to use Lean Sigma to dramatically improve the uh, labor productivity. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Productivity definitely is an area that uh, various companies look for a solution. Uh, two weeks from now, I will participate in a forum organized by uh, you know, FT and uh, not to you know, do any advertising for them and uh, Ernest Young because Ernest Young just finished a major report on productivity in China. So I will comment on their report. So not to, of course, you know, uh, uh, you know, tell you too much details about that particular report, but one finding in that report that I, I found to be particularly interesting is that uh, there's a huge gap in terms of productivity mm -hmm. in China. The, the level of variance uh, is astonishing. Okay. And also, Chinese companies are catching up very quickly in the area of productivity right. because they realize that they can no longer rely on cheap labor forever. They have to use some unique combination, uh, sometimes interesting combination of modern technology and the labor. So their level of automation probably would not be as high as MNCs, uh, but they are able to create some kind of uh, combination where they can use labor, where labor uh, is nearly as productive, but your automated equipment where you have to. So a good example this would be like BYD, uh, which is an automaker in China, and also a major battery maker. I mean, in years, they have kind of perfected that kind of approach. So I think that's really a major area for improvement. I see. Well, the one question that I would ask uh, to back that up in terms of productivity, and one thing that we hear a lot from clients, um, is they certainly see a gap that exists between the cost 
and the productivity of what they get out of their assets in China. One area that they see opportunity is in those clusters, in those areas in the country where there are certain sector know-how and capabilities um, that go beyond just the basic labor productivity, but also innovation. Maybe we, uh, both of you can talk about the development of clusters and how important or maybe not important that is in terms of improving upon that productivity and taking that next level in terms of that value added and not just about the made in China concept. Uh, I think this is a very in important uh, uh, area that for the company we could not only rely on cheap labor. We also could not only rely on uh, labor productivity improvement. Uh, of course, there's a huge opportunity for a company. Uh, uh, Ingersoll used to have uh, a facility that uh, uh, 20 years ago, when we designed the uh, company, we, uh, we built this company. Our target is to produce 100 units of compressor, uh, one of our products, uh, in one month. Uh, and uh, after 15 years after all these uh, labor productivity improvement, uh, last year, w every month, we could produce 800 units air compressor. Same facility, same number of employees. So this is a very good re uh, example about how important the labor productivity is. But as a company, we could not only rely on labor activity. There's another piece of major thing is how we could innovate. The innovate, uh, innovation, there's many ways we could innovation uh, that uh, we could go to with uh, existing product, go to new market, we could uh, enter into new market with new products, all these things we could do. And uh, we could learn things like uh, um, one of your reports uh, uh, being published in the, in the uh, Economist is uh, uh, talking about Alibaba. 25,000 employees, and within just uh, less than 20 years, grow from nothing to be billions. And uh, we're looking for this company will be public, and they will, the value will be 50 billion or more than that. So, and also another exa good example is Huawei. It's uh, there's less than 30 years uh, history started from zero to be 100. 50 billion company, a uh, US dollar. So, so the innovation could play a much, much bigger role for the companies in emerging market, including China. Thank you. Dr. Pong? Um, yes, just like Mr. Yu mentioned, the companies like Huawei uh, has been very good at finding uh, the right uh, ratio uh, in terms of the input and the output. For example, Huawei's engineers are probably 60% as productive as their U.S. counterpart, counterparts, but they make about 20 to 30% of their you know, U.S. counterparts. So that means they have Huawei, which you know, save 50% of the total cost, and that's where the cost advantage of, of Huawei. And other Chinese companies, of course, have found other ways of innovation. You know, I, I talk about the BYD example of combining uh, automation with uh, uh, labor work, and the other companies in China uh, have been, you know, able to, you know, do like business model innovation, to find different ways to do the same thing, uh, or to uh, do like lean operation, uh, lean production, like Toyota uh, started, uh, you know, 20 years ago. I have a, a EMBA student uh, who is in a very traditional apparel uh, industry. They used to have very large you know, uh, volumes for the baseball caps, but because of the, the financial crisis, their, their order volume went down so much that if you have this kind of huge assembly line, it's no longer economical. So they divided the huge assembly line into smaller ones. Each one will be self-contained, uh, you know, just using the logic of uh, lean operation. So dividing one huge factory into three smaller ones, they were able to maximize productivity. So there are indeed many different ways where you can get you know, more productivity out of um, your operation. But one point that, that I often remind my students is that th the area for easy growth uh, probably is over forever in China. And they should no longer believe in uh, cost advantage because they, a lot of them, I mean, some of them probably will continue uh, along this route, but a lot of them have to transform themselves to uh, the next level. I'll call it limited differentiation. Hmm. They have to offer 
somewhat different products and services in order to be you know, separate from the, the, the mainstream. I think that's what a lot of Chinese firms will you know, aim at in the future. Right. Um, before I open the floor for questions, um, sitting here on the podium, I cannot help but realize that I'm the only female sitting here, uh, representing only a quarter of, of, of the population up here. Now, obviously, retaining the capable females in the workforce, especially for the senior management, would be a critical one. And this is a universal theme. How do the three of you see this? Kind of surprise question. <laughs> no, that's not a surprise. It's uh, a company it's, like. It's a very important one. Oh, it's very important. Uh, a company like Ingersoll Rand do see this. Uh, we call it the diversification or inclusive. It's very, very important. Uh, I have uh, in total eight persons report to me, and uh, four of them are females. They play a very, very important role uh, to the team. Uh, not only the function like finance, like HR. Uh, like a BD, but also a different uh, viewpoint to uh, the rest of the team. And uh, so this uh, uh, helped me to achieve double digit growth within the last three years. And I believe this year at least we'll have another 20% growth. So female leadership really could to help us uh, to grow faster and grow uh, profitable. Thank you. Actually, uh, certain Chinese companies are very good at uh, uh, promoting and retaining female talents. For example, Wahaha. Wahaha has a lot of female managers, actually, at the director level. I think the majority uh, will be female managers because Mr. Song Chi Ho believes that female managers are more royal and, uh, and that they are more stable. They're willing. If you, if you treat them well, they will stay uh, for, for, for the lifetime. And um, uh, so that is very important uh, in nowadays, where talents just keep moving around. And I think uh, the, the challenge is there because um, uh, for multinationals, for example, uh, when they have female talents, because they are rare, and if they can get the job done, they are you know, really uh, you know, uh, you know, sought uh, after uh, in a market. So you have to offer something different uh, from your, your male managers. Because what I believe what female managers want is somewhat different uh, from male. So I think it's not just about you know, uh, how, how to uh, give you more responsibilities, but also it's somewhat uh, a balance, a life-work balance. And I think that will be something you know, uh, for better understanding. So flexibility on retaining that talent is important. Yes. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? Yes, please. Can you state your name and also the company that you work with, please? Okay, I'm, I'm Neil Zhang from ISDC. Um, in general, I think the rate of pricing might be a bad news for the employers or for investors. But I think it's certainly a good news for the employees. And I have two questions for the speakers. Uh, the first one, um, we learned from the last slide that the average wage in China remained lower than some Asian and South African countries before 2005. So my question is, uh, what happened since 2005? And the second question is, um, what's the composition of the wage rising? Which groups plays the biggest roles in the wage rising? For example, the golden colors, or the white colors, or the blue colors, like city builders or, or rural laborers? Thank you. Well, in terms of identifying those, those issues that have been driving um, wages, certainly the level of investment and interest in China is going to be a major component of that, um, specifically since 2005. If you look at back to that chart, uh, really wages have remained flat in most places of the world. They have not gone down. Um, in the U.S., is certainly that relative wage has gone down. So certainly that's part up. But I think the other situation when you talk about the practical aspect of wages and the competition for wages has really become very intense here in China. Um, targeting particular competitors and offering not 20, not 30, but double the amount of salary, uh, both for blue and white collar um, type of talent, has really pushed those wages up to a level that that gap between productivity and, and wages is starting to take notice, particularly with multinationals who are operating in China. Uh, yeah, something uh, happened around 2005, uh, magically, because I
recall that when CKGSB was founded 11 years ago, you know, uh, I mean, we have been offering something quite standard and, uh, and uh, simple. If there's a professor from the U.S., we be basically match what he or she makes uh, in the U.S. So 10 years ago, you know, people were very happy uh, when we match, you know, salary. But now, when they realize that it's only a match, let's say, you know, 100,000, you know, uh, U.S. dollar, you know, annual salary for a professor. Then when you kind of convert it into RMB, it's like nothing in, Ch in China. So they actually expect more. Why it was a huge advantage 10 years ago, and now it's not even you know, uh, negotiable. I mean, you have to do a lot more. So, so I think it is a real challenge. Uh, I mean, that's probably just a byproduct of how fast the Chinese economy you know, uh, had developed. Yeah. Uh Regarding to the, this how to retain the talent, uh, companies like us do have options for senior leaders. We also have a binding contract uh, if we send people to, let's say, go to business school for EMBA program or, or overseas trainings. But I don't think these are sufficient. In uh, many cases, uh, employees tell us, talent tell us, what they're looking for is fairness. They're looking for training. They're looking for... Uh, career, right career path. So I think the best way to retain, to attract talent is to grow faster. Grow faster than the industrial, grow faster than competitors. Then, because many talents, they, why they, they change the job? Because they want to, have, uh, want to have a promotion. They want to get the promotion faster. Uh, so if we could have 30% growth every year, this means three years later, we double the size. Every three, if every three years we double the size, and what we need, we need all the talents. Like two years ago, when I took the current job, I told my talents, if you, are, if you see yourself a talent, be a little bit patient, because I need 25 branch managers, 25. If I have, want to have a 25 branch manager, I need a lot of marketing manager, sales manager, product manager, all the leaders. If we, if we have a bunch of managers, I also need quite a lot of directors, general managers. So if you are talent, be patient with me. Only two years or three years. So I think the growth is more, uh, it's, it's more important to retain and to attract the talent. Thank you. And to very quickly add up on that, um, actually, if you look at the statistics, um, wages start to grow in China uh, from, from 2002 and 2003. Uh, a, a key reason why the wage issue hasn't been brought up to people's attention until recently is because we've always had this huge surplus of labor migrants coming from the rural area. Um, and that would be a key th thing to watch for China's reform in the next few years, how the urbanization uh, will plan. And Im very importantly, along with that, would be how the hukou system would um, reform would be important. Um, now, the food is almost ready. Um, do we have a final question? Yes. Uh, yes. Please. Okay, so I'm from the um, National uh, Development and uh, Reform Commission Center. So, and also I'm a graduating student from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Um, so I have two questions. One is on my personal behalf. The other one is on a, a larger market, marketing level. So my personal question first. Sorry, can you speak up a bit? Okay, so my personal question first is uh, how do you value uh, foreign, like top tier university students like me and uh, like versus the students from the top tier universities in China. And the second one is uh, like the marketing level, like as employers, what's your risk in recruiting um, the talents in China? Like the specific risks, I, I couldn't understand that. Okay, thank you. Uh, a few things. I think uh, intelligent perspective, I will see the students from overseas and from China are same. Uh, but uh, uh, we, are, we do looking for uh, to have the talent from both uh, uh, local uh, business schools and also international schools. A few reasons. One is, if they come from overseas, definitely your foreign language will be better, uh, if not the same. Uh, 
at least the same. Second is a perspective you could bring from either from US or from UK or from other countries could be quite different. When we talk about innovation, one of the key things for innovation is mix. Mix the team, mix the perspective. Um, and also uh, the, the benefits for, for but you have disadvantage. You may not know China too well uh, it, because you have been with, uh, along, uh, away with China for two or three years. Uh, and, uh, and also, your expectation may be higher than the other local graduates uh, for the promotion, for the salary, or for the other things. And compared with the local uh, uh, the, the students or graduates from local uh, business schools, their, dis their advantage definitely they know China because they have been in China all the time and, uh, and they have a very good relationship in China because MBA schools, uh, especially Changjiang, is not only to learn something but also to make friends and uh, which could help uh, the future business. Uh, so I see this, uh, this uh, both sides have a pros and cons and we do respect uh, the graduates from both uh, uh, business schools. Thank you. David, okay. Um, I think we'll, everyone must be ready for lunch. Um, with that, I'd like to thank all the panelists for your great insights. Uh, thanks very much.